um, heroes as a writer, someone whose career I think is a, is a model of excellence and that one that I'd very much like to emulate, um, if at all humanly possible. But uh, I think this is the first book you've written start to finish since we've been real friends. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And you wrote it, you know, uh, in six months during COVID while the rest of us were just getting our shoes on. How did you, how did sorry, you manage that? Sorry, but it that? was three months, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say it. It was fast, yeah. So like you, like all of us, I was just stuck with myself, um, sick of myself, and, um, but had a lot of thoughts. It was a traumatic year in the United States, 2020. Um, because it was not just COVID, it was the George Floyd protests, it was the election, it was the specter of civil conflict. Um, and so I decided I have to make some use of this enforced isolation. I can't go out and report, I can't travel, but I can think and read and write. So this is my first essay book. It's the first book I've written that is essentially a long essay um, rather than a reported narrative. And in a way, it, it was easier because less legwork. I, I wrote it in an intense, compressed time between sort of the early voting right before the election, that's when I began, and then finished it around the inauguration. So it was in that crazy, uh, dramatic series of events that I, I sort of pulled back from them in order to write it. It's also a bit harder than a reported narrative because you have to be thinking on every page and in every line. It's, there's no storytelling, it's your ideas and it's a high wire act because it, when your ideas start to wobble or run out of inspiration, you lose, you lose the reader. So it's, it's um, in some ways a harder task than telling a story based on, on reporting. Yeah, and you, you've said in the past uh, that Orwell was a model, right? You were thinking very much of the kind of short book interventions that he had written. There's a few books that were models that I think of as pamphlet type books where it's compressed. It's about a particular moment in history. It's an attempt to comment on it, to push things in a certain direction, but it also has some at least value that might lasts a bit longer than that moment. Orwell wrote a book that very few people know called The Lion and the Unicorn in 1940 when Britain was being bombed by the Nazis. Um, it begins, um, as I write, highly civilized people are flying overhead trying to kill me, um, which is a pretty hard to beat opening line. But there are other books um, around the same time um, a book called Strange Defeat um, about the French defeat by the Nazi Blitzkrieg by a French historian. Um, there's, I mean, aiming even higher, Baldwin's The Fire Next Time is a, a book in this genre. Right. A, a book by Walter Lippmann, the American journalist, um, called Drift and Mastery that's at the beginning of the progressive era. So I was reading these books from history that all had this in common. They were short, they were um, literate, and they had a point of view that they were trying to advance. Um, and so it's a, it, it's a book that I think of as the pamphlet. It's not a genre that Americans think about too much anymore, but it's, it's got a noble history. Uh, yeah, I imagine your, your, the book you had published just before this was a very, very long doorstopper biography of the diplomat Richard Holbrook. So I imagine it was probably nice to switch tempos and get into something, get in and out of something uh, taut and, and precise. Did you want to read a couple of paragraphs uh, to give them I'll, a flavor? I'll, I'll read the opening just to get the feel of the book into the room. Um, I am an American. No, I don't want pity. In the long story of our experiment in self-government, the world's pity has taken the place of admiration, hostility, awe, envy, fear, affection, and repulsion. Pity is more painful than any of these, and after pity comes indifference, which would be intolerable. I know a woman who said of her own husband and children, 
they're not the people I would choose to be quarantined with. Are my fellow citizens the people I would choose to be quarantined with? Well, there's no choice. They're mine and I'm theirs. During the time of separation, we Americans with our dollars and easy smiles and loud voices have not been welcome abroad. US passports once worth stealing are no good. Formerly mobile, we're trapped with ourselves and one another. A lot of Americans have explored their options for expatriation, a deceased Irish grandfather, a suddenly promising Canadian girlfriend, an open invitation from the government of Ghana, a loophole in New Zealand citizenship law. As for me, I'm staying put, and not just because these exit strategies are not available to me. I want to see how it all turns out for my children, if not myself. Whether a huge multi-everything democracy can survive or will perish from the earth is a matter of interest and not only for us. Yeah, that really gives a good sense of your voice. Um, you're, so it's no surprise to anybody here that we're an extraordinarily polarized and divided society. Um, and the heart of your analysis is that we're split into something like four different Americas. Um, real America, free America, smart America, and just America. Um, I wondered if you could speak a bit about that and, and, and lay out your idea of what's kind of at stake uh, as these four segments of society struggle for um, their vision of America to obtain. Yeah, I mean, we all know that we are two countries. Every election proves it. Red and blue absolutely no getting away from that and it, the divide grows deeper and more insuperable every election. So I'm not denying that fundamentally we're two, but I think each side, red and blue, is divided within itself as well. And the, div the divides happened chronologically over about a 40 year period. So in the book, I tell the story of how First, free America, which is Reagan's America. It's the shining city on the hill. It's the America of free markets, turbocharged capitalism, low taxes, deregulation, market fundamentalism. That was, and maybe in some ways still is, the most politically successful and powerful of the four narratives. These are narratives. They're not really segments of the population, although different Americans sort of adhere to different narratives and change and, and maybe even our mixes. The narrative of free America came out of the, the 70s, out of you know, the, the misery of stagflation and uh, the oil shocks in the Carter years. And Reagan promised that if only we got government out of the way, because government is the problem, um, the American people with their energy and enterprise would do incredible things. There would be more prosperity. There'd be more freedom. And freedom is sort of the, the watchword of this narrative. And in Reagan's language, it had a lot of attraction. It had a lot of political power, um, but it failed to deliver the promise because what has come out of decades of free America, which remains the mantra of the Republican Party elite, it's still the orthodoxy to this day um, of the elite. Instead of broad prosperity, where the, we are more stratified and unequal than in 100 years, we have less social mobility than Europe. You know, calcified Europe has, it's easier to rise in most that's European countries. That's what they countries. say. I find that hard to believe, but that's, that's what they say now. Raj Chetty, look at the facts, man. No, there, there are lots of statistics about declining social mobility, which is in some ways more important than inequality because the gap between rich and poor, of course, is related to declining mobility. But when you can't rise, that's when you really do feel the system is rigged against you. And the American promise of opportunity for all, which is the great magnet, the great engine of American capitalism, um, it fails. And that has happened for more and more Americans. Of course, there are new Americans who are rising, but the numbers show that um, a fairly secure middle class 
of the post-war years has become a very precarious uh, lower middle and working class today with the years of globalization. I think there were two big trends that, that launched these four narratives. First is the end of the industrial era, the rise of the knowledge economy and of globalization and technology, which uh, destroyed one basis for the economy and created another, which had lots of potential for educated people. But if you weren't educated, you were going to fall behind. And that division has become more and more evident. There's also what I call smart America, which in, in a sense comes a bit after. It's the Clintons narrative. It's the narrative that if you, that education is the key to everything. And the division between the successful and unhappy life is education. If you do well in school, go to the right college, enter one of the knowledge professions, then you'll be a winner in the era of globalization. It's a softer narrative. It does, it's not quite as hard-edged in its capitalism, but it it's a kind of a, a twin or a, a cousin maybe of free America because they both welcome the world of high tech and globalization, neoliberalism in the in the phrase of some um, critics. Smart America too failed its promise. And this is something that you and I might argue about a bit. The watchword is meritocracy. That's what smart America is all about. To the best go the rewards. But over the years, the meritocracy, I think, has become more and more an aristocracy because it's harder and harder for anyone not born into it to get into it. You, my friend, are a counterexample. You were not born into the meritocracy. You earned your way into it. But well, if I, I was raised like an immigrant. My father had a, like an immigrant mentality of the next generation will have what I didn't have. And of Americans in, say, the lower 60%, it's immigrants who do the best. Um, but a lot of Americans, native born and not, um, I mean, I saw one statistic that said for someone from the bottom 20% to get into an Ivy League university is no easier now than it was in 1954. After all the government interventions and diversity and opportunity and scholarships and opening it to the working class and to women to minorities, it's still just as hard because social mobility has declined. So there's a description in the book of the kind of smart American family who see their family business as success. And they're gonna do everything necessary to read the right books to their kids, to have them socialize with the right other kids, Cooking to go to the meals. right schools, because there's a long way to fall if, if you fall and they, so they, they cook the right meals, they have family dinners together, they, you know, their kids know, you know 10 million words by age five or whatever the number is, uh, which is a huge gap between educated and less educated families. Um, and then they'll marry meritocrats like themselves. And all of that to me suggests that there's something aristocratic about it. It's created a new class system, except it's based on education. Not surprisingly, these two narratives produce rebellions on both the left and the right. On the right, what I call real America is the rebellion that started in some ways with Sarah Palin, who used the phrase in the 2008 campaign. She said, I love, she was in North Carolina at a fundraiser, and she said, I love being in the these real American towns where the people who grow our food and teach our children and fight our wars live. I love being with you real hardworking patriotic Americans. In other words, there's some Americans and we should name them. They are white Christian heartland, less educated Americans who are real. They can fix their cars. They work with their hands, not their brains by and large. And then they're the fake Americans. I would be one of those. Laptop class. Laptop class, the elites, coastal elites, the metropolitan globalists in the cities, and also a lot of immigrants, black Americans. She, she didn't name them like that, but her, look at her crowd. 
they're not in her crowd. And in a way, she didn't have to name because Sarah Palin introduced a new thing, which is white identity politics. In other words, a politics that is based on being white of a certain kind of white, the boots she wore, the music she walked on stage to, Redneck Woman by Gretchen Wilson. Um, it was a, a kind of, I was in Ohio reporting on the campaign when she was nominated. And I was with these working class Ohio women, white women who told me we'd, we'd love her. We, we just love her. She would fit right in here with us. And I asked them, do you think you're qualified to be vice president? And that was not even the question. All that mattered was sympathetic identity, not her knowledge, her policies, or her credentials, but her identity. So straight line from Sarah Palin, John the Baptist, to Donald Trump, who realized it as a winning politics, and who in some ways was more willing to go to the limit with it than Sarah Palin was, because she still cared about being considered less credential. Trump revels in it. Um, and so Real America has challenged the orthodoxy of the Republican Party, the free market orthodoxy, um, even though Trump allowed Mitch McConnell to enact tax cuts. It's not what Trump is about. He doesn't appeal to people based on deregulation and tax cuts. It's much more primal. It's, it's much more about blood and soil. And in a way, it's introduced a kind of European right-wing nationalist idea to politics that America has never had at the presidential level. You didn't get to be president by talking about uh, culture, faith, and identity. You got to be president by talking about democracy and limitless opportunity. You didn't get there by trashing democracy, which is what Trump does, or by trashing America as a land of equal opportunity, which is what Trump does. So in a way, he's moved us, I think, closer to the European um, narrative. And the final narrative, another rebellion on the left, I call Just America. And this is a real generational rebellion of children against their parents, of the children of the meritocrats who say to their parents, you've been telling me a lie. We're not becoming a more perfect union. Uh, I'm saddled with a lot of student debt. Um, there's this thing called overproduction of elites. There's too many of me, so I can't find the right job. And what's more, America is a fundamentally oppressive country from the beginning, from 1619, which is the beginning. And the, the identity of different groups determines your fate in this country, whether you're going to be an oppressor or oppressed, but the, the hierarchy of groups and the nature of the oppression has really not changed in 400 years. It's a, like real America, just America is pessimistic about all the promises of democracy and opportunity. And it's, a, it's been a really powerful rebuke to the complacency of the previous generation. So I see this as a kind of story of the knowledge economy producing winners and losers and the unwhitening of America through immigration, through the rise of a more empowered black middle class, producing a kind of cultural shock and rebellion. And all of this adds up to democracy being in danger because I think both real and just America are fundamentally illiberal and um, are not forces for um, for liberal democracy strengthening. Instead, I think they've really undermined it. And that's kind of where we are today. Sorry to go on so long. No, that's important. But that is the main story of, of the book. You have to lay that out. And, you know, what I like so much in the book is that you are um, critical of each uh, America. They, not, neither of them, none of them are without their um, substantial flaws that when they interact with the other Americas, bring about this kind of fraught situation we're in now. However, I might be just in, hopelessly enthralled to the status quo, but it seems to me that the real tension, the real problems come in real and just America. Um, it seems to me that actually a lot of what um, real America is upset about, seen from a different perspective, is actually the, the, the real progress that American society has made to become more diverse, more inclusive, 
uh, more cosmopolitan, um, and that could be seen uh, as a good thing, instead of it being seen in the way it is seen in many Western democracies now as a threat to the supposed uh, the, the uh, traditional the traditional population that's yep. entitled to the country and everyone else is an interloper. And it seems to me that just America also, you know, any society that's overproducing elites in Peter Turton's um, mm -hmm. framework, it seems to me is also doing something right. A lot of people are, 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 we have educated more people than ever have been educated in society before. And we have to figure out how to make everybody find meaningful work, but actually, the kind of cynicism and liberalism and kind of uh, lack of respect for democracy and democratic norms that were the that were the engine of uplift during the civil rights movement or previous eras that no longer seem to enchant these th these just Americans. It seems to me that that combined with the backlash on the right is where the real drama and tension is. It's definitely where the drama and the energy is. Because yeah, the energy there, too. <laughs> there is something exhausted. I think about the the two elite narratives. They no longer politically have. Um, I mean, watching Biden struggle to enact any of his agenda is is a sign of a kind of exhausted, at least an exhausted Democratic Party, um, which is very much torn between smart and just America, and they're fighting all the time. So your view of it is encouraging and maybe true, but nonetheless, we're stuck with this, um, this, this unhappiness leading to mutual hatred and to disbelief in our institutions as, as pillars of fairness, equality, freedom. You can't talk people out of that. You can't tell them, look, we actually have it pretty good. You know, look at you know, whatever, Moldova. Yeah, um, I was just in Egypt, I mean. Yeah, but people don't want to hear that. Right. They they want, they look at the person who, you know, is on TV or the person who lives two towns over. Um, and, you know, as a reporter, it's almost my job, it is my job to hear them out and if possible to empathize. And maybe I suffer a little too much from being soft on, people who I actually hope never get political power. But that's partly because I just find them interesting and in some ways legitimate. I understand it. It's when you, as a reporter, when you allow someone to tell you their life story as they've experienced it, you don't want to argue with them. You want to bring, bring it out of them. And that was more what The Unwinding two books ago was about. This is you know, more of an argument but it's still a little bit inflected with that desire to understand, even though I'm hard on them. I mean, <laughs> you're hard I, on hard you're hard on, on just America on all of them. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I think you're hard on just and smart America. Um, Maybe because I, I'm closer to them. Yeah, because because there's always the kind of frustration with your own group, right? Um, what what year did the unwinding come out? 2013. 2013. That's what I thought. so. You identify 2014 like 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 John Haidt and Greg Lukianoff also do in the in the coddling of the American mind as a crucial turning point, which is the year that uh, Gen Z arrives at college campus for the first time, uh -huh. um, and also many other things start to happen. But this new generation kind of arrives, and millennials grow into um, higher positions in in media, cultural, academic, and corporate mm -hmm. institutions. And then a whole new language starts to appear exactly. in mainstream media that had hardly been used before. And it's also probably because um, Twitter uh, became really the engine of this uh, this new rhetoric. It had been kind of on Tumblr and other places and comes into Twitter and And, gets and I think dis disappointment at the end of the second Obama term. Yeah, and then disappointment the, with the supposed post-racial America that Right, Obama didn't deliver the thing that we yeah. had hoped. Yep. But then 2020 becomes an actual hinge point, right? And so I wonder if some of the changes that were inevitable coming up generationally in 2014 were not necessarily inevitable unless we had this confluence of events in 2020 that exacerbated these problems. Right, so without COVID, would there have been George Floyd protests? I, I'm not at all sure. I think there had been Black Lives Matter ever since Trayvon Martin and Ferguson, which goes back to 2014. But would it have reached 
the scale of the biggest protests in American history if there hadn't been all this built up tension and anger and, uh, and frustration and desire for community that the, the early isolation months of COVID produced? I don't think so. And then would it have happened without four years of Trump? I don't think so. 2020 was a terrifying year. And I remember and describe here how in the weeks before the election, it was normal for people to say, do you think there's gonna be a civil war? <laughs> I remember that. It was normal. This wasn't crazy conspiracy-minded people on Twitter. It was your friends and neighbors. I even thought about maybe I need to get a gun. I don't know. Upstate or in gun. Brooklyn? Well, we were in the country where everyone had a gun except me. And I thought, wait a minute, this isn't looking good. <laughs> everyone has a gun except me. I don't, I'm gonna be the one guy <laughs> who can't defend himself here. My family uh, convinced me that, um, that don't get it. not to get the gun, yeah. But it was a, a rational thought. And all the big downtowns in Philadelphia and New York and Washington were boarded up and shopkeepers left the city. And there was a palpable, sinister, baleful light, you know, in the air. And it was quite a legitimate fear because Trump became more and more irrational as the election neared and refused to uh, promise to respect the results. And there had also been a summer of not just protests, but violence and then counter violence. And so, and people were buying guns in unbelievable numbers in 2020. The violence didn't happen with the election. And in fact, the election was one of the most hopeful experiences of my life. It went cleanly and smoothly in spite of what the Republicans now want you to believe. It was as fair as can be every investigation by reporters, judges, county officials has found that there was virtually no fraud. I mean, look at what happened in Florida in the year 2000 yeah, yeah. without Trump whipping it up. It, it was a hanging chads. hanging chads. In 2020, because actually the election officials really prepared, I interviewed an election expert who said, they're ready now. It may not go well because people might become violent, but the people who are in those nonpartisan jobs, secretaries of state, county officials, boards of canvassers, all these obscure people really were taking it seriously. And the American people took it seriously. 155 million people voted in the middle of the pandemic, which was by far the most ever, and um, stood in long lines. It was very moving. It was like a a final testament of faith in democracy when we had really wondered if it was going to last. And then came January 6th, and we found out that um, far from having come through, we basically just missed the assassin's bullet. I think of January 6th as like someone with a gun to the head of democracy, pulling the trigger and a little erratically and missing, but then reloading and aiming again. Um, and it's still aimed at our head. So that in some ways is the more important lasting um, event, which comes at the end of Last Best Hope or just before the end um, as something to remind us that we're, you know, we're still in a really bad place. Oh, yeah, we are. Um, I want to talk about the bad place that we're in, but before we, we get there, um, yeah. This summer of 2020, uh, it was such a, culturally, it was such a significant moment. And you are really one of the, there, there were five of us, but you were the one that made the pros beautiful and really was a ringleader and brought me in. Um, and, and I'm grateful that you did to, to organize uh, the Harper's Letter, which was a kind of intervention that I'm so extraordinarily proud to have uh, done my bit to be part of and that I think actually really introduced uh, an ongoing international conversation about some of the real um, illiberalism and censoriousness that's creeping in from both the left and the right and kind of imperiling um, 
an open society that values tolerance and values, you know, respectful discourse. I mean, th th there was a specific conversation in the United States, but it really resonated here in France. You know, it was reprinted in Le Monde, and I still talk about it um, in almost any interview I would do here. Um, how do you feel about that two years, two years out? Um, you know, I just, I, I don't think I go a week without somebody mentioning it to me. Well, you became the public face of it because the other four writers essentially chickened out when the, uh, the shit hit the fan and said, Thomas, you be our spokesman. And you did a great job, a really brilliant job. But we should remember what's in that letter. It is the most harmless, even milk toast, as some critics said, defense of the need for a culture of open debate and of certain amount of tolerance for different views that you could imagine. It was not a call to arms. What, right, right. what we wanted to do, if I'm sure you remember, is write a text that a huge diversity of people could get behind. And, and they did. I should mention, because not everybody stays on Twitter thinking about the Harper's Letter, um, 150 uh, writers, authors, intellectuals from um, mostly from America, but J.K. Rowling and some and Margaret Atwood, some people from Canada and the U.K. Um, Kamel Daoud. Kamel Daoud from, yeah, from Algeria, uh, who was one of the first people to, to sign up. Uh, Cornell West, Malcolm Gladwell, a lot of people signed this from across the ideological spectrum. Just a defense of free speech and tolerance that we thought was a testament to its strength, but it angered a lot of people. Well, we had Noam Chomsky. We had people on the right. We had every identity group. The one group we really had our time getting was under 40. <laughs> so this told me the real division is generational. And the attacks came from people who the were under 40. The only person who rescinded her name was under 40. Because I, she came under pressure. And there is a lot of pressure. And basically, the, the letter that we thought was just this unimpeachable defense of not shouting each other down, not banishing not each other, not trying to get people fired, not trying to get people fired, allowing for a fair range of opinion to be considered legitimate, you know, before you start arguing with it and fighting it. Um, not, um, uh, yeah, creating such narrow parameters of acceptable discourse that people start self censoring and eventually just go quiet. It's things we were seeing in America for several years. And then the summer of the protests, it reached a boiling point, which is exactly when the letter came out. All of that seemed to, to us just like, this isn't gonna make any difference. It's not gonna make a dent. I thought no one's gonna pay attention. The thing exploded as if we'd been building a bomb in our basement within minutes and it continued to explode. It's now known as the infamous Harper's letter. It can't, it's not the famous, it's the infamous. And partly because some people objected to JK Rowling being among the signatories. Some people um, thought we were a bunch of entitled old white guys when in fact, a lot of us were not guys and not white. And not white, yeah. Um, and who don't wanna be criticized on Twitter, which is nothing about what we were, so, it told me the experience being in the center of that storm for a few weeks told me the culture is even more dysfunctional than I thought. And Last Best Hope is partly about Tocqueville's idea of self-government as an art. So Tocqueville toured America and described America in terms that still resonate. And what he was particularly taken by was two things. One, what he called equality of conditions, which meant essentially a kind of social status that everyone at his time who was white and male, it was not everyone, it was white and male, had a kind of roughly equal status in society, which he had never imagined Didn't coming from France. France yeah. No. And second, and related to equality, is self-government which he described as an art. He's, he used the phrase habits of the heart that you need to acquire. It's not natural. You're not born knowing how to govern yourself. It's hard. Most people don't even want to do it. You'd rather have the responsibility taken off of you. But if you learn the art, the skills, the habits, 
um, it is the answer to his biggest fear about us Americans, which was our individualism, which comes directly from equality. So if equality leads to individualism and this kind of, as he said in an aristocracy, everyone is joined in a great chain with the king at the top and the peasant at the bottom, but there's a link between them. Democracy breaks the links and frees everyone, but now there's nothing to join us. And so we Americans are infamously individualistic what is it that can overcome that self-government, having to come together, listen to each other, think about each other's point of view, come to some compromise and govern, solve problems. That has been lost. We can't do that anymore. And the evidence is everywhere. So part of what I write about is what we might need to do in order to be capable of governing ourselves again. And I think it has something to do with creating conditions of greater equality. Yeah, that's a perfect way to put it. And my last question for you before opening it up to the audience is just, you know, it's been really interesting seeing um, a country like Ukraine value these conditions that we're starting to squander and take for granted and not really realize are such a precious inheritance that are fragile. Uh, and you've been thinking about Ukraine a lot. Is America still like the last best hope uh, internationally as well? I think Ukraine is the last best hope. Um, I think we've lost that spot. We People no longer look to us. They don't trust us. We've become unreliable. We might well see Trump coming back. How can Europe count on us? How can NATO? How can democracy when we have our own Putin and our own Putinists uh, in a powerful position in the Republican party? Um, I heard a Ukrainian philosopher say, Europe has the rules, but maybe not the values. Ukraine has the values, but not the rules. Uh, in other words, Ukraine is still this corrupt and somewhat anarchic and um, weak institutions, all that we know, which is why the EU is very wary of it. But I think you, the Ukrainians are fighting for something in addition to survival that should speak to us and in a way has woken people up. I don't know if that's happened here in France, but oh, it's very much so, certainly too. happened in the United States. Um, and it's gonna make it harder for our Putinists to, um, to, to be Putinists because right now they, they've had to shut up. Trump has even stopped um, buddying up with Vladimir. So we'll see if it lasts. We'll see if our attention span lasts, but. Right now, Ukraine is um, maybe the most potent force for democratic values in the United States. Okay, so who has a question for, for George? You've got 15 minutes with one of the best writers in America. Can I have a big round of applause, please, before? Thank you. So I should encourage everyone on Zoom, uh, hello, to also post a question because we can we can do those too. So the questions, yes. Did you, did you have, was that a question? Or you was <laughs> you wrote out the question? <laughs> well, there's another old entitled white guy who signed that infamous letter after some worrying events at the New York Times. Uh, no, I, I did I did want to as uh, something in the interest of yeah, open debate. Um, yeah, we've gotten this far without mentioning Roe v. Wade, um, which is, um, and I'm just wondering in this fractured America that you've been um, describing uh, so powerfully, um, how do you think this bomb, which uh, appears almost certainly to be coming our way, how do you think that's gonna play into the already uh, pretty charged uh, confrontation of two Americas uh, especially uh, given that we're six months out uh, from the midterms. Thanks. Thanks, Roger. Um, it's been coming for a while. I mean, there have been some draconian state laws in Texas, Mississippi. In fact, there are some states where it's pretty much become impossible for a woman to get an abortion. Um, and, and that's largely red America. So it's not a complete shock, but I think it will come as a shock because an overturning 
of something that two generations of women have grown up and come to maturity just as a as a given is um, one of the biggest political upheavals of of our lifetime, and it will only deepen the divide and intensify it and make it more because abortion is one of those issues where there really is no meeting of the sides. It is for one side, it's mass murder on an unbelievable scale. And for the other side, it is the right of women to control their bodies. And Caitlin Flanagan of The Atlantic wrote a really fine essay about how neither side can quite recognize the best argument of the other side. But that's because it's so intense, so personal, so it's it's moral it's a moral issue and moral issues are famously impossible to resolve through compromise so i i don't see how it's not gonna uh create even more division but what it might do politically is restore some energy to the democratic party because especially for a younger generation of women who never knew a time without roe v wade um this might drive them to become involved in politics in, in a way that they weren't before. Thank you very much. I was um, um, really taking exception to something you said. Now, I don't know how you handle yourself in the book. So maybe it was just being sloppy because this is oral. So it's not so much of a critique, but I really don't think one should say in one sentence and in one breath, um, minorities and, and women. That just is so imprecise. I mean, women are 51% of any population. You have them in smart, free, um, just, and real America. And um, so please be more precise in your, in your I think talking about I uh, use women. the phrase um, in describing groups that had previously been kept out of higher education. And I think, just as a matter of fact, I'm not going to take it back. I think it's true. Hi, quick question. So thank you so much for this talk. Um, I was thinking actually about a book by, um, I think, Arlie Hawksfield mm -hmm. about um, strangers in a strange land. It yeah. kind of brought back some of the themes. Yeah. And one of the questions she tries to answer is why are, is that category, that demographic that you so perfectly described, the Palin voters, the white working class, real America, why are they consistently voting against their own economic interests in many parts of the US? Um, and where yeah. does that come from? It'd be great to hear what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, you know, that's a per perennial problem for the American left, which wants to shake them and say, don't you understand that you're, this is, you know, um, false consciousness, you are not seeing reality, you're, you've been deluded by Fox News. And I guess I would say, we should take them seriously when they tell us what their interests are and not assume we know their interests better than they do. So if they say their real interest is religion or the traditional family structure or abortion or um, even not wanting to be forced to send their kids to school with kids who look different from theirs, we don't approve of it, we don't like it, but we have to acknowledge that this is the way they see their life. And so if you offer them a higher minimum wage and say, here's a higher minimum wage, will you stop thinking about abortion? That's a losing, you, when, when I put it as crudely as that, you can see that's a losing political approach. Um, I do think that if government shows it can improve people's lives, the material conditions, as it has done in the past and has been failing to do for quite a while now, it won't change their values. It won't get them to stop caring about those other issues, but it might at least lower the level of poison in our system, um, which I think partly comes from this sense of the game being rigged against them. So I, you know, Biden was unable to do much of that, but I think he had the right agenda. I have this fifth narrative at the end of the book, which I call Equal America. 
And I think that was essentially Joe Biden's agenda. He's, he's not a creature of any of the four narratives. He's before that. He's like a, from the Roosevelt Truman era, uh, which was the Democratic Party of the fair shake, the little guy. And that seemed to be his approach to domestic policy. The problem is he, he's in a divided party that's barely half of, the, of Congress. And so he was unable to get much of it passed. Um, but I, I, you know, I understand the argument about economic interests, but I also think it's a, it's a dead end to go down because it doesn't take people seriously. It's, that, it's sort of that Marxist idea that you have to disabuse people of their false consciousness, but people don't want to be. It doesn't work. Uh, hi. Um, I had a question that is more maybe from a French perspective. I'm French. And um, it's about the way you use the word America. And it's interesting because in French, we have this thing where some people use the word Etats Unis or, you know, um, emphasize the United States versus America, which to me as a French person tends to ring as a the combination of a narrative. And I was wondering if there was not, I mean, we're in a time when narratives are in at odds with each other. It's like there's so many narratives that get fractured and fractures. That's what it looks like from our perspective. And isn't there a question of trying to say like, what is this United States thing that we're trying to make a nation emerge from maybe something, a set of rules that you said earlier versus this America that everybody seems to have an idea about different versions of it, cultures that seem to be irreconcilable, you know the word I'm trying to say. And uh, yeah, so yeah. In, in other words, is it a sort of false picture to speak of America when there are all these states and within the states, there are all these counties and yeah, you're right. But one of my maybe utopian goals with this book was to describe our culture and even our identity as something you can recognize as American, which I think is possible. It's not easy because we are so wildly diverse and we've drifted so far apart and um, we're so contentious and raucous today. But I think when you go abroad, it's easier to see that there is an American identity. And I have a whole list of traits that foreigners can immediately recognize as American, including using first names with people you don't know and being clueless about social conventions and social relations and structures um, and the breeziness of our waiters um, and even our violence, I think. All of these things I trace back to what Tocqueville called the passion for equality which has produced a common culture and has been able to absorb uh, people from all over the world, generation after generation, and turn them into Americans in a way that is sort of the envy still, I think, of some European countries. We still are able to absorb immigrants and essentially wash out the, the place they come from. It's not altogether a beautiful thing, but our culture is so accessible, it's so unsubtle that, and our language even is so unsubtle that people can come from anywhere and become part of it. And obviously there's struggles and there's prejudice and there's tremendous um, refusal to accept some people as Americans, but by the time they have kids, those kids are so far away from where they came from. And that's, I think it is because of that, um, the, the passion for equality. It's not the idea of equality. It's not the goal, the dream of everyone being equal. It's not as nice as that. It's everyone wanting to be as good as anyone else and have no limits and have no barriers. And um, I think that has produced an American identity. It's very raw now. It's pulling apart. You can hear the ligaments stretching and even snapping, but I'm not prepared to see secession or civil war. I don't want to go that way. So one of my goals was to try to portray us as maybe we're still a little more alike than we think. And for, through the eyes of non-Americans, I think it's even a little easier to see that. 
Uh, that was really interesting. Thank you both. And uh, I, while you were talking, I was just thinking about um, uh, it, there seems to be a flip side to the to the smart America and to the and to the uh, real America in that the real America seems to have a large appetite for um, complete fantasy like QAnon. Uh, I don't know how you say that. I don't say it very often here. But... I think you got it. <laughs> okay. I, um, and so there's a kind of appetite for a uh, new appetite for wild fantasy on one side. And then with things like cancel culture, there's a kind of fanaticism of the smart side. So I was just wondering that it made me think of that if you had both of you, if you had any responses or ideas about that. You're right that both sides have become less and less able to tolerate differences of view without seeing fundamental moral questions almost in terms of good and evil we can't compromise with the other side because they're evil we can't compromise with evil so we have to fight it and destroy it and truly each of those two groups that you just mentioned does see the other as a existential threat a mortal threat to everything they care about to everything they think matters in the country whatever the good is it's under threat by the other side and that's those are the conditions of civil war where there's no possibility of finding a, a way of living together um, and it's all supercharged by social media by cable news by you could say a cynical elite class of politicians and media figures who are benefiting from it and who have turned the people in some ways on each other but even during covid which you at first i thought would be the one thing that might to some degree unite us because we're all human so we're all vulnerable to it instead it showed every single fault line in the country whether between the essential workers and the non-essential workers between the cities and the countryside um and it in terms of fantasy what real america saw was a bunch of experts telling them what they had to do in order to stay healthy and a lot of it made sense but over time the experts began to contradict themselves they were obviously not certain about it a lot of the time the covid numbers didn't seem to reflect the policies all that well for a while florida was at the top and then it was near the bottom and no one could say this is what you have to do and the experts became the enemy for real america because they were this class this elite class this privileged class that seemed to have power over them and this also goes back to tocqueville demagogues thrive on democratic people's resentment of an elite when there's an obvious class like epidemiologists that has power and influence and is controlling to some degree their lives democracy says that should be my decision not yours and a demagogue then can step in and say those elites have taken your voice away i'll give it back to you that's trump that's how he used covid to try to get reelected because he certainly couldn't use he, the uh, the management of COVID to get reelected because it was an utter disaster. So instead, he used the, the the demagoguery, the divisiveness of COVID, to the point where even masks, which I don't think any other country saw as a political weapon in America, masking became the the ultimate political weapon. George, we have a question on Zoom from Jennifer, who asks, what do you think the under 40 want today in American politics? And I'll use this question to represent the under 40 crowd and ask a question that I have, um, which is that you were talking a lot about equality and what strikes me. I mean, recently uh, with Elon Musk um, being able to buy Twitter very quickly, 44 billion dollars, only one sixth of his total wealth where does the extreme inequality that we see from the side of the atlantic fit into um your vision of these four americas well i hope that it's a 44 billion dollar loss for mr musk and that in the process he destroys twitter and so 
all of my friends who are now on Twitter go off Twitter. And Thomas, the, <laughs> your thoughts? Th Thomas is one of the more restrained users that I know, but I understand why you have to use Twitter, just as I understand, I think, why people under 40 are angry at my generation. I mean, we've passed on inequality on a robber baron scale. We passed on a planet headed for immolation. We've passed on um, this dysfunctional political culture that can't legislate, can't solve problems. Um, student debt, et cetera. There is a lot to be angry about. The problem is the, um, the righteousness that comes from anger and which is fuel, which social media's algorithms want. That's how you stay on. Doesn't, doesn't get us where we need to go. I think it drives us further down into the ditch. So it's, um, and I, I also blame my cohort for in some ways being patronizing and indulging the more destructive tendencies of under 40 Americans by saying we understand and you have every right to be blah, blah, blah. And we're going to we're going to fire this person or we're not going to let this person speak on campus or we're not going to publish this article or we're going to make sure that no one like that ever gets hired here. I think that's a huge um, surrender by smart America in order to have peace with just America. And I see it over and over again in my own sphere. Um, and I don't think it, again, it doesn't solve anything. It doesn't get us where we wanna go. It just buys short-term peace. Um, I hope Musk can kiss that money goodbye. I hate Twitter. Um, I think it's, I lurk. I lurk. I read you. I need to know what you're thinking and saying. Um, but I, I don't post because it's like a drug. If I started posting, eventually I'd be posting every seven minutes. My kids would go hungry. Uh, I'd be strung out on Twitter all the time. So I, it's not that I'm better than Twitter. It's that Twitter is stronger than me. So I don't post.